Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Passing Photography Arts. Thank you all for attending this evening. My name is Roland Spatugan. And I'm Ellen Friedlander. We're really happy to be here tonight. I also want to introduce our technical director behind the scenes, Alexi Butts. Hello out there. Hello, Alexi. She'll be backing us up in the chat uh, section of our presentation. Uh, before we get started, uh, we would like to acknowledge the Tongva, who are the native people of these ancestral lands that are present day Pasadena. Uh, we give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, and learn on their traditional homeland. I also want to say his name, Ralph Yarl. He is a courageous, resilient, young African-American 16-year-old teenager that was shot for ringing the wrong doorbell uh, at a house in Kansas City, Missouri. We need justice for Ralph Yarl. Tonight's event, it's really hard to follow that, but tonight's event is very exciting. Women changing the film and TV landscape. You lost, I can't see. Oh, we have, and anyways, we're really happy to have Laura Zelenke, Beth Dubber, and Vanessa Clifton with us tonight. They have three amazing presentations and a panel discussion. You're next. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, my trusty colleague here has just. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a little bit about our, organiz about our organization. We are Pasadena Photography Arts. We are a nonprofit volunteer run organization. Uh, we have two programs where we do spotlight and um, uh, emerging photographers and you know established photographers. Our programming is open show and forum, right? Oh, we're very grateful tonight to have Howard Landau who is underwriting our show. Thank you, Howard. Howard used to be an advisor with PPA for a very long time. So we're very grateful for all that he did for PPA when he was part of it. Yes, thank you, Howard. And if you, any of you in the audience, see something that you learned from today, and if you feel that this it's is worthwhile continuing, then I do encourage you to uh, please uh, donate again at our website. Uh, we do appreciate donations, um, but we do need some funding to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. Ah, photo award. Um, we're very excited. This is our very first Pasadena Photography Arts Photo Award. We have a $2,000 cash prize for storytelling. We are very excited. We have a few lovely, we have actually a good number of projects that have come in. We have about 10 more days before the deadline. So get that work into us. We're very excited to have Baronex Perello as the final judge. I will not be judging. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to other people. So please, please send that work in. Yeah, if my students are watching, sorry, you can't bribe me with donuts or, or cookies. Uh, I, I'm not part of that, uh, the judging. But I do encourage all of you, if you had a body of work, you know somebody who's a photographer or you're a photographer yourself, please submit um, and you get a chance to win two grand as a mini grant. Um, also, uh, another way for you to support Pasadena Photography Arts is to go to our online print shop. You can buy a piece of fine art, and the proceeds from those sales will be going directly to our organization. And here we are. Uh, our next event will be Open Show. Open Show. Uh, you want to? May 18th, we have Lori, Lori, Lori Pond and Erica Martin will be hosting a live open show. They have not selected the artists. The artists have been, we have them all in. So please sign up for that live open show May 18th, Tuesday night, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I mean, sorry, Pacific time. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, this not that time zone. Okay. No. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. We are very excited to have our panelists here with us this evening. First, we're going to introduce all three of them, um, and then they'll have a chance to present their work. After each presentation, there will be a few minutes of discussion amongst the panelists, and this would be a great opportunity, and I highly encourage the audience to type in in the chat your questions, and we will inject those questions into those discussions after each presentation, okay? Uh, so are, are we all ready to get this party are started? Ready to get this party started. Started. All right. All right. So um, go ahead. Our first, first presenter will be Beth Dubber. Beth was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio and earned a double BA 
BAs, one in German and the other in studio art from Cleveland State University, making her way to Los Angeles in 2003, where she began her career as a unit set photographer in the entertainment industry, where she currently works on feature films and television. She is a four-time nominee of the Publicist Award for Excellence in Unit Still Photography for Television, and this year was she won. So congratulations, Beth. Yay. Please say hello. Hi, yeah, hi, thank you. <laughs> okay, now, Laura. All right. And our next presenter is Laura Solanke. Laura's on-set photography career began in 2005 when she was asked to take photos on her AFI student thesis project. 18 years later, her career has spanned countless productions ranging from feature films, commercials, and television for networks like Netflix, ABC, and Hulu, to name a few. Her images have been published in numerous publications, and her production gallery work featured on billboards in Los Angeles and Times Square. Laura is a proud descendant of both Asian Pacific Islander and South Asian ancestry. Her background inspires her to seek out projects that focus on representation and diversity, both in front and behind the camera. I'm really proud to have her today because I had the honor of actually working for her uh, for some of her production still jobs uh, on on set. So please say hi to Laura. Hi, thank you guys so much. And our third panelist tonight is Vanessa Clifton, who is coming from us from Brooklyn. She's a base, she's based, she's a fine art and documentary photographer who discovered photography when she stumbled upon her father's camera at the age of 16. And she has been captivated ever since. She graduated in 2012 from Western Michigan University with a BFA in fine art photography. Within her work, she likes to explore themes about humanity, especially themes about the human connection and relationships. She has shown work at the Society for Photographic Education, Black Arts and Cultural Center in Michigan, and concluded her BFA thesis with a solo exhibition at the Sanoax Gallery in Michigan. Welcome, welcome, Vanessa. Hey, everybody. Yay. Oh. All right, so this brings us to our presenter. So without further ado, uh, Beth Dubber, please take it away. Okay, I'll share my screen. Just give me a moment. Okay. All right. So I'll just dive right in. Um, and I just wanted to say that I'll be hitting a number of topics that might not be cohesive at first, but it'll play into the larger conversation. Sure. Um, but just to introduce myself, um, my name is Beth Dubber. I live in Los Angeles, and I'm also working on trying to be local in Berlin in the summer times. I'm a mom of two toddlers. I have 17 years in Local 600, um, preceded by several years of just trying to get a foot in the door. Um, worked many, many odd jobs. Uh, and I also just wanted to say, and this goes for all of the photographers here, that our work is copyrighted not only by us, but by the studios. And it is in no way um, okay to share that with screen grabs or in any way. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So I, uh, so some of you know Aline Smithson. She's an educator and a photographer. And I took one of her classes in 2016 called the next and in that class she asked a very pertinent question um, to all of her students which was um you know what what were some of your earliest experiences with photography like visual experiences that would now um you know influence your work today so i really had to think about that for about two months and uh, it felt so good when i remembered that I was inspired by my childhood love of television and crime fighting women. Um, I had a little pop up come on my screen. Do you guys don't see that? You guys don't see it, right? I don't think so. Okay, just checking. So I used to go to the corner store to buy these trading cards, the Charlie's Angels. Um, they were 25 cents and they had a little piece of bubble gum in them. Some of you might, might remember, it might be too early for you guys. Um, but looking at these cards is actually when I first began to contemplate on-set photography. So I realized these images didn't come from thin air, um, that someone was actually taking them with a camera and that person must be a photographer. 
So I began to allow myself to daydream about it, like what it must be like to actually be there in the same room with these amazing women. Um, this concept seemed alluring, elusive, and like a fairy tale. Like how could a girl from the Midwest do something like that? It seemed like a dream job for other people. So flash forward a few years, I was really into heavy metal, which I still am today. So um, it never really went away. <laughs> so I used to go to many um, concerts with my best friend, Donna. Oh, sorry. Uh, wait a minute. Sorry about that. My screen paused. You share. Uh oh. Was it a, is it a, there we, yeah, go. There we go, we're back. Oh, okay, good. Here we go. I just see something in the middle. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I spent all my mornings before middle school at the 7 Eleven magazine stand perusing all of the metal magazines, but I began to become influenced by band photos that I saw in Hit Parader, but this series in particular was my favorite band, Motley Crue at the time, with Blood. And I distinctly remember thinking about what it would create, what it would take to create this image, what kind of liquid did they use for Blood, and how cool it would be to be the person in the room taking that photo. But again, it just seems so far out of touch. Um, flash forward, in 2003, I made my way from Cleveland to Los Angeles, but how would I ever get onto the slot? So I just want you to know that we don't have time for that story now, but I do have a full keynote dedicated to this, um, <laughs> this topic, and it's about personal work. Uh, so 23 years after my hit parader daydreams, I was finally learning how to use fake blood in photos. I began to day play as a prop photographer on various TV shows and was a huge blast. So prop photography is similar to this, it's crime scene photo photography. And the, the man here is a prop master. He's the one who is responsible for splattering the blood to make sure, and I'm sorry, I, I should have had a trigger warning um, in case, but it's all fake. Um, but he had to know like what this splatter would look like if it was a jumper, you know, someone who jumped off a building. And then um, the woman here is our AD who kept us on schedule. And today play means I've often had that asked. It just means that we get a call from a random production a day here and a day there. So in the summer of 2009, I got a job on a feature film called Project X. This is a still I took from the set of that film, and it also accur accurately describes how I felt. So I just want to take a step back now and say, and just ask the question, what is still photography, unit still photography in particular? We get asked this a lot, even by our colleagues on set. So I do teach aspiring unit still photographers, and I already had um, this taken from another keynote, but I thought it would be um, appropriate here as well. But our basic agenda is to get singles, doubles, group shots, portraits of all the actors, um, behind the scenes, product placement, plates. Now plates are just empty sets that are lit with no actors in them. Um, and some various usages that we have are streaming, screen menus that you've seen like on Netflix, for instance, uh, press, magazines, books, periodicals, websites, social media, award campaigns, set dressings, locations, local film commissions could use them. We take portraits of department heads and interesting details or graphics from shows ad infinitum. There's still so much more that our work goes to that we don't even know about or ever hear about. So when I first got started, um, oh, now I'm just going to go through some random photos of mine and talk about how I, when I first got started, um, is it was probably around 2003, like the year I entered here. I actually got started back in Cleveland in 2001 was my first project that I was a still photographer on. But when I came out here in LA in 2003, some of the still photographers who I knew, and I only knew a few, like three or four, but none of them had children. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to be a parent and that and I didn't want my career to dictate that decision. 
But at age 39, I had a little bit of a curveball and was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I realized that I had such laser focus on my career that I put aside being a parent. So I was afraid it might be too late for me to become one. Um, and I bring this up because it took me some time to get through it. And after my surgery and recovery, I just remember my doctor saying, um, hey, you know, it's time for disability. To, it's up. You got to go back to work. And I was so tired and exhausted. If anyone's had surgery or any kind of procedure, um, you know, it takes some time to get your energy back. I was so exhausted. I was like, I'm not ready. I got to do yoga or something like I got to get physically fit. And this doctor, they're all absolutely clueless about what it takes to work on set. And what it takes to work on set is you have to be 100% physically fit and agile because you don't know, like on location, you might have to like lug your equipment up and down hills and the bathrooms might be a half a mile away that you have to walk to and there's uneven ground. Um, you know, it's just that you just don't know what you're going to get into. But um, I think he stretched it out for like another week, but I had to go back and I was totally exhausted. He asked me if there was light work, if I could ask for light work. And I was just like, yeah, if I worked in a freaking office, like, no, not in the film industry. There's no such thing as light work. I think my clients at the studios would be like, uh, no, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they would want to be helpful, but um. But you know, after my recovery, um, I met a man who also wanted a family. And so we started one. So these are just the slide on the right is like a TV newborn. If any one of us had a baby that big, um, <laughs> that would be pretty painful. <laughs> There's a reason for that, but we could talk about that later. <laughs> and here's my two little ones. Um, and I just put in a photo of them just to show, like, I just took it like a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago, um, because, you know, it took me, I started the parenthood journey really late in life. I, you know, like I said, the breast cancer at 39, but I had my older daughter here uh, when I was 44 years old. So I didn't know, I still, there was IVF involved and everything. And um, my second one, I just went through, um, we did become foster parents through LA County's foster care system and adopted our, our sweet little boy, Alex. Um, and presently, me and the children's father, we're, we're not together. So this does, and I just bring this up because being a, we're co-parents and we get along. So it's actually really great. Um, but it does make it more difficult to navigate this career in the film industry. I have more balls in the air, but it can be done. I just wanted people to know, like, I always get asked, can you be a mom and have this career in the film industry? And I say, yes. And I could be a single mom, but I'm not. I'm a co-parent, which is different, I think, um, than a single mom. I just wanted to bring that up for people. So just to get back to stills, I love um, the behind the scenes were really, it is the thing that really allured me about this career. I love it. And in this, like things just really came together so perfectly. And I was totally done with shooting the scenes for my client. I was just um, really in interested in what the special effects person was doing. And um, I was just lucky to get the shot. No one was around. I was like, wow, this is perfect. Um, so there's a lot of humor in my work. In fact, I work in comedy quite a bit. Um, this is an early slide. I often try to catch in between moments. Um, we're just kind of hanging out, waiting for things to get set up. This was one of my favorite shows that I've ever worked on. It's just absolute dream team to work with Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd. And as Ellen um, graciously mentioned that I did win the Publicist Awards for Excellence in Unit Still Photography this year for my work on Hulu's The Dropout. And I just say this because it's, I call this award 20 years in the making. Hey, there's like no, it's not a fast, fast road to get to this career at all. And um, it was my fourth nomination to over the last 10 years. So I kind of felt like I was like, oh my God, I don't know, maybe, but it, just being nominated is actually really cool. It's a lot of, um, you know, marketing and press for every single photographer who's nominated, but it is an honor to win because it's the only award of its kind that exists for this um, craft. So as I mentioned before, I teach aspiring unit still photographers. Um, I have a brand new website. It's called onsetphotographyworkshops.com. And um, there you can sign up for live 
um, Zoom classes. I'm going to have an in-person retreat where we can work on our portfolios, portfolio building, um, probably in September. There's some recorded classes for purchase, and I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, the best way to reach me is Instagram, Beth Dover Photography. If you'd like to be on my email list, just DM me your email address and um, just a couple other websites. And also I'm on LinkedIn as Beth Dover. Thank you so much, Beth. Amazing. That was great. Um, you, can keep, you can keep your slides up in case we want to refer to any of your images. Um, I want to encourage the audience members right now, uh, if you would like to have any submit any questions for Beth, please go ahead and do that into the chat uh, before we open this up to a discussion between the panelists. But really quick to start off the questions, your go-to heavy metal band right now, quick answer. Player. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I'm going to open this up to questions from the, from the panelists, Laura and Vanessa, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Beth. That was awesome. Um, my question is, um, what now? Um, what's next for you? Well, um, okay, so I'm on a show right now. Oh, I can't talk about it. I forget the NDAs. <laughs> I don't forget them, but we can't resign NDAs. We're not allowed to talk about it. But I'm on a show and it ends in May. I had been on the fence about going to Berlin this summer. Um, and I still don't know if that's, I went last summer. I'm really trying to like, carve a place for me in the film community in Berlin because I speak German. Um, I have a degree in German and I've also lived there before. And I just love Berlin. And it's just so much fun for the kids too. So that's that's what I'm trying really hard to build. Sounds really great. I have a question. I'm gonna interrupt because Ben Vanessa, you can hold your question because I can't wait. <laughs> Um, I'm really curious. You said your work goes to all, so many different avenues. So you get paid for your day's work or or however, but then the work goes in so many different directions. Do you get residuals? Let's say if, if it ends up on a billboard or if it ends up in other magazines, do you all get other money back to you from the work that you've done on a day job? Uh, yes and no. Um, often this is a work for hire situation, but the intended usage for work for hire is publicity. Now the definition of publicity is different from the definition of marketing. So when you have usages that go towards marketing, say um, key art, the billboard campaign, that yes, we should have, we often have side deals for buyouts, um, which is the appropriate way to go. And there are some integral studios who honor this and really appreciate their photographers and, you know, um, pay us for, you know, the key art, which is super important. Very important. Vanessa, do you have your question? Yeah. My, so my question for Beth is, how do you, when you were first starting your career, how did you stay encouraged during some of like the slow moments? Oh my God, it was so, this is something that I talk to a lot about my students, with my students, because it's, um, gosh, okay, so I have so much to say on it. Like I could probably talk for about a half hour, but I just try to do three things per day. So when I get really, I can go down a rabbit hole emotionally, the work, finding work is not in the computer. Finding work is not me sitting in my office um, getting out there and talking to people and handing out my card as a photographer is the way to get work, getting in person, doing work for people, doing events, just getting out there, like no matter what. So if I'm not getting the jobs, I'm not getting paid for jobs, then I volunteer for nonprofits and I'm handing out my card and I'm telling people what I do. And for here, you know, here, this is Los Angeles. So there's a lot of people in the film industry and they'd be like, oh, I just met that event photographer, but she works on set. And my friends producing this indie, you know, it kind of works like that. Um, but I think it's really important to get FaceTime with people. And what often happens is people just sit at their computer and they will just send out cold emails. 99.99% of those will never be answered ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're so lucky to get anyone to answer it. Like, mm. Then, you, okay, so send out three emails and then do a couple other things and mm. then like go for a walk or like do something else. It's, it'll happen eventually. And it's going to take a lot longer than you want it to take. Uh, I have to, I want to 
chime in on that. I was telling my students, um, I, I've had a series of gigs this past past week. I'm, I'm a freelance photographer as well. And there were like graduate portraits, you know, uh, I'm trained to do that as a photographer. And, you know, they would ask, how'd you get this gig? And I said, well, I met the person who referred me on a bike ride. I, I do group rides. I live in Pasadena and I met this person on a bike ride and she referred me to these jobs. And next thing you know, I'm working, I'm, I have these gigs. So it's exactly a testament to what you're saying. It's like, you can meet people anywhere. Just be ready to, to communicate that you are a photographer. Yeah, I have those cards ready. I always tell my students too to like have unit still photographer, so there's no confusion on what you're doing, um, what you're trying to break into on your card. I mean, now people aren't like so much physical cards, I guess, but I still have physical cards and I still give them out. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm sure if anyone else has questions, please uh, put that into the chat. Uh, we're gonna go move forward to uh, our next presenter. So our next presenter is Laura. Please take it away. Thank you all. Can we get them? All right. Okay. Um, thank you all again so much. Um, what I love is how unique that every unit photographer has their own origin story of how they got started. So mine, uh, Rowan's actually mentioned a little bit of, I started with AFI, um, student films, but I actually went to film school and um, film school did not launch me into anything specific. I came out to LA, I was very lost, didn't know what to do. Um, so it wasn't a year and a half after graduating film school that I met someone who's going to AFI. She saw me taking photos, we started talking. I told her about my backgrounds and then she asked me to take photos on her film set. Um, I went home, looked on the internet, like literally there's one website that confirms taking photos on set was an actual position. And so my first day on set was literally the beginning of my career. Um, I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and now, uh -oh. trying to change the slide here. Are you guys able to? We see the first, your first slide. Let's see. If Not you working. need to stop and start over. Yeah, if you need to stop and reshare it, whatever's, whatever's the best, yeah. Hey, Laura, something happened to mine and I had to like click on it instead of use, I had to use my mouse for some reason. I don't let's know if that'll help. Let's see if we could, uh, still on the first uh -oh. one. Uh -oh. hmm. We tried exiting out of uh, your, uh, Acrobat Reader, whatever you're using, and just restart it. Uh, I can do that. It's okay. It's okay. Technical difficulty. This happens. Oh. There we go. We see your desktop. So, yeah. We have the beginning days. Great. Of cool. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. There we go. So um, my first day on a film set was an AFI thesis film, and it was literally the beginning of my career. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, from that one student film, I got asked to do another one. And um, 18 years later, here I am. Uh, it was not as easy as that or as quick as that, but um, that was that was the beginning. And to this day, I'm still friends with that person who asked me on her set. So thank you so much to Mana. Um, so shooting on set combined my love for filmmaking. I love the process of filmmaking. I love photography and it's just the perfect combination. I was so passionate about shooting on set. I tried to find as many sets as I could as, as possible, offering myself up for free on student films and anything I could find on um, Craigslist. And I had a full-time job at the time. Um, when you start this, you, you need another job to kind of keep you going. So it was very much a hustle, but it was a passionate hustle. Um, and so when I knew that I wanted to commit to this uh, career, I invested in one of these. Uh, these are called sound blimps. I'm so glad we don't have to use these anymore. These are boxes that you put cameras inside to muffle the sound of the shutter. They're heavy, they're bulky not fun to use, um, they're backbreakers. And so today, if anyone wants to get into unit stills, you can invest in mirrorless cameras. They're just computers that you get to hold and they're great and they're light. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to jump into some of my stills, some of my favorite ones over the years. This is from Never Have I Ever. Um, this show was so meaningful on so many levels. So I'm going to talk more on a personal level. Um, you know, representation is just so important for a lot of people. It's, you know, it's, it's been a thing for a while now. Um, and so when I read in the trades that this show is going to be made, I immediately contacted my person at Netflix and said, hey, can I work on this? Um, he hadn't actually gotten any information about it. So he's like, I'll let you know. Um, but luckily, three, you know, a couple months later, he contacts me and says, the show's yours if you want it. And I just, um, my inner teen was so healed by working on this show. Um, just the story of how the lead actress, my Trey Ramakrishnan was cast out of like 15,000 people at an open call. Um, it's, it's really amazing. You know, um, I, I don't think my, anything like that really happens, you know, in like eighties or nineties, early two thousands. Um, maybe it did. I wasn't aware. Um, this next shot is from Murderville. So on a technical level, as a unit photographer, um, you really want to capture talent. Um, and so one of my favorite things as a unit photographer is watching performances, um, being privy to like the actors processes. And so watching Will Arnett, a mastermind of improv is just so amazing. And so, um, so I was just laughing throughout this entire time, but it was also really challenging technically. Um, they were moving, they're improving. Um, you can't really anticipate what they're going to do, what their actions are. So that's, um, you know, that was an, on a technical aspect, um, you know, that, that was a little challenging. Um, you also want to be mindful of your shutter count. You don't want to be delivering thousands of photos. You want to be mindful about how much you're shooting. So you can't just keep spraying these, these files through the camera. Um, this next shot is from Better Things. Um, so this was on the fifth and final season. Um, one of the things as a unit photographer you need to be mindful of is um, actors eye lines. Uh, you don't want to be a distracting element um, while they're performing but this cast was so great this was already mid-season we had developed a trust and understanding and um, I knew I was blatantly in their eye line but they also saw me and just didn't care. They, they knew that if I was there I was there for a purpose and so I also respected their space, so I shot it. As soon as I felt like I got it, I got out of there. And so as a unit photographer, you know, you're just trying to find that balance of doing your job, giving the talent some space. It's a give and take with talent. Um, and I'm pretty excited to have gotten that shot. Um, another one is, this is of Drew Barrymore on Santa Clarita Diet. Um, so as Beth mentioned earlier, the, uh, there's this thing called day playing. You kind of hop on set for the first you know a day here a day there I day played on this on the very last day of shooting and so anyone who's a unit photographer who's watching knows that day playing is already has its awkward challenges so coming on the very last day was even more awkward um the the rest of the cast and crew are like they're hugging exchanging rap gifts and here I am I'm just trying to find the bathroom and do my job but um this is one of my favorite shots from from that day and I'm going to turn it around on myself. So this is the summer of uh, September of 2020, the year of the pandemic. I was about seven or eight months pregnant. And um, I'm, I'm going to bring this up because I personally had only positive experiences showing up to work pregnant. I had EPs, directors, making sure I was sitting and had enough water. But I talked to other females in crew, like in other positions um, in the industry and Revealing their pregnancies too early is a very real concern because there's a fear of um, how much they, uh, how it affects their hireability. And so that is, you know, I think that's like a, a conversation we can definitely have. Um, but I've been fortunate that even when I returned from maternity leave and I needed a private room for pumping, I got nothing but positive support from both networks and productions for um, receiving a private room. Uh, this next shot is just one of the a fun shot of where uh, one of the few places I try to find for myself. Um, so a couple of years ago on another show in similar setup, I was trying to um, squeeze myself between the cameras. Um, one of the cameras was a little bit lower and the camera operator was after we were done with takes was watching me and he said, you had a little flyaway hair and I was waiting for it to touch the camera. 
because you're so good at like not touching anything. And he's like, and I was going to give you, um, I was going to give you a hard time because your flyweight hair touched camera and it never did. So I, I joke that my, uh, one of my superpowers is um, spatial awareness. So, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, uh, let's see. And then, and that's, that's my presentation. Um, I provide a really quick and glossy um, review of like my beginnings and everything. But as Beth also mentioned, I'm sure Vanessa will also say it is not easy. It is so, so hard. It's so challenging. This profession requires so much passion and commitment, um, but it's also so rewarding. Um, and this this industry is a lifestyle choice. It's yeah. it's a hustle culture, um, and you know work ebb and flows. It's just you have to choose how to live your life in balance with this industry. And so, um, and yeah, and uh, you know, and everyone has their own unique challenges. So thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions. Wow, thank you, Laura. You uh, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, unit Women in unit still photography are superheroes. <laughs> Not all heroes wear capes. They carry cameras, right? Amazing. You know, it's, it's super interesting because what I'm learning from the three of you, yet to hear from Vanessa, but I'm sure it's the same, is the work, like the physicality of your work. And I, I shot a lot of tennis and I did a lot of sports. You know, I was out there for like eight, 10 hours a day in the sun. It sounds like you are very, that your profession is very similar to a, you know, a, a working uh, photographer on a tennis court or following any kind of sports. Is that true? Yeah. Do you feel do you feel like you're you're carrying the equipment? You got to be in and out. You got to be really quick. It's oh, definitely. Um, yeah. Sports photography, um, documentary photojournalism. Um, we're we're encompassing all, all of those aspects. Wedding photography. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like like I said, you really have to be physically fit. Um, you know, there are so many points in my journey where I wanted to quit because I just felt like I was in physically like there but you know you um you make that choice and you get physically fit to make it work <laughs> um and yeah do you ever are there ever two of you on a set very very rarely um uh, there's a few times when I have been able to but it's because there's a unit photographer and then there's a props photographer that happens to be there on the same day um yeah, that's usually the only time when you ever have um, two unit photographers. So our role on set is so lonely. You know, we don't have anyone else that relates to oh. our position, that understands what we do. Um, and as Beth also mentions, like a lot of crew don't understand our, our role and our position. So, um, and that's why I think the stills community is so important for us as unit photographers, you know, meeting and knowing other photographers, being able to talk about our jobs and how it goes. And, all that kind of stuff. Vanessa and Beth, do you have any questions uh, for Laura? Yeah, I do. I have a comment. Oh, oh I don't know if it's a, I could turn it into a question, but just a comment. Like, um, so I was pregnant and had my baby at the end of 2015. And Laura had, you had your child in 2020. I think the experience of what you said in my experience of be showing up pregnant on set were so different. And I firmly believe it was the Me Too movement that really changed things in the film industry. Now, we still have a long way to go with um, attitudes, I think, on set. Um, but I was constantly asked and questioned, like, why are you working? It is so hot. Are you OK? Can you do this? Are you like? I was out in like hundred degree temperatures. I felt great. And we were like climbing up a hill, but I felt really good, you know, when I was showing, but constant questions, are you okay? I mean, it's just like, why are you working? Like, I, I'm just like, I was so upset by that. And I got asked that on every single set. Like I had to work. I, are you going to pay my bills? Like I'm perfectly capable of working. So like, I'm really glad that you, Laura, you had that experience. It was so positive. And I did not have places to pump. I had to go in like the the Andy Gump down the street. And oh, I, that's terrible. I couldn't do it's, it. I don't know. I, well, it's officially a law now. It's oh. illegal for an employer to not provide a private room. 
So, um, you, so I, so I knew that I knew that like law. So making sure the network's on my side and the production company knew. So I was always provided, uh, an office in the, on the stages or, um, a, uh, a trailer if we're on location. Um, so I'm, I'm curious when that law went into place, if that was, if that affected anything, if that changed or was a reason why you had to pump in a porta potty. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good question. So I have a question for you, and it might be for both of you. How do you how do you work pregnant? Like as far as scheduling, I know a lot of times the networks they kind of sometimes they can kind of schedule us last minute. How did that work out with like doctor's appointments and just taking care of things as a expectant mother? Uh, well, so for me, most of my pregnancy was during the pandemic. So my, I really only worked for about a month or two at the end in, around September. So I can't really say too much about how I managed the scheduling, but my show that I was on at the time did shut down because of um, a bunch of COVID cases. And mm -hmm. so I was already eight months pregnant. And so by the time we get, came back, I would have been like um, two weeks away from maternity leave. And I just chose not to go back. It just wasn't worth it. You know, vaccines hadn't been out. Like it was very new. So I made the choice to not go back to work, even though I could have gone back for two more weeks. Um, that was just personal choice. Um, I actually did have a relatively hard pregnancy. Um, so it was just, it just made sense at the time. Great. Thank you so much. I'm looking at the chat and we have some several questions in here, but I think what I want to do is save it till the end because they will they will pertain to all three of you I want to give you guys all a chance to, to answer these questions so um last but not least uh we could have you stop sharing your screen laura and we're gonna take it over to brooklyn <laughs> take it away vanessa okay let's see share okay how's that yes all right we're good <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to thank the team for having us and allowing us to share our work and talk about our careers. Before I talk about my unit work, I kind of wanted to get into my background and how I even found unit stills. So I took photography in high school. We had a really nice dark room and I ended up taking two classes and I really fell in love with the medium and I loved it so much that I majored in it in college. And my mother was very upset, but I'm very stubborn and I kept moving forward. Um, at the end of college, I didn't really have a plan too much. I knew I wanted to shoot fashion and New York being the fashion capital. I thought, you know, maybe I'll try New York, but you know, I'm from the Midwest, it kind of seemed unrealistic. I thought maybe Chicago would be a better fit. So what happened was I ended up in New York anyway, things kind of worked out. And when I got here, I started photo assisting, I started studio managing, and I did a little bit of digital tech work. And as I'm doing all these things, I'm realizing that I don't really like the fashion industry too much. It's a lot of ego, it's a lot of superficial, and so I started to explore different avenues of photography. I shot weddings, I shot events, um, products, still life, a little bit of portraiture. But the one genre that I really loved is street photography, you know, work, um, documentary photography, photojournalism. That is a work that I love. And um, this is something that I really pursued heavily. But, you know, as I'm shooting this and I'm researching more, I'm learning that it's very hard to make a living with this work. So I'm still at a crossroads and I still don't know what to do. So I kind of decide to shoot weddings. I know a couple of shooters here in New York that, that are kind of high end, they're kind of boutique and they make very good livings. And so what happened was I ended up on a film set doing some BTS work testing out the silent shutter of one of Sony's bodies actually. And I had such a good time. And I just remember talking to the cinematographer kind of about her role and her job. And she was telling me about some of the different careers in the camera department. And I went home and I was just really intrigued. 
And I researched everything that I could and I came across all of these jobs. You have director of photography, you have operators, you have first assistant camera, second assistant camera, you have loaders. And then I came across this little job that said unit still photography for photographer. And I was really confused because I didn't know that that was a job. I had previously assumed that all images from film and TV were just screen grabs and that is very false. And so in 2019, I started to build my portfolio. I sent a lot of cold emails, I cold called, I reached out to um, smaller production companies, I booked stuff with Craigslist, I booked stuff with Facebook, um, a lot of low budget, no budget, all kind of jobs. I just wanted to build my book. And so what happened was there's a photo lab in LA that came across my work on Instagram and they pitched me to Netflix and Hulu. And I ended up booking, uh, I booked Russian Doll and Wu-Tang and Wu-Tang season two and season three. And, um, I also want to thank Beth for helping me with this. I ended up doing the key art for season two, and she kind of helped me talk through, you know, some of the, the deal points because it's a little bit of a different language, and I wasn't familiar with that at all. Um, as far as Wu-Tang, this has been the biggest show of my career. I did season two and season three. And it's really important and it's really special to me because I come from a family of singers and musicians. And also I have an older sister who, when I grew up, I watched her listen to Wu-Tang. And for those of you who don't know, Wu-Tang was and still is an iconic hip hop group that was started in 1993. And they have had global impact. They are known all across the globe. And so this is a work where I can really see my photojournalism. I see uh -oh, hang on one second. Oh, I gotta fix one little thing. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. And congrats on that Wu Tang gig. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, here we go. So sorry. Can you guys see this okay? Yes. Yeah, we got it. Mm -hmm. I opened the wrong file. So this, these are some of the images from Russian Doll. And then this was a much shorter job. And then Wu-Tang was the bigger job. This, I've been union for three years now, and this has been the biggest project. And I can really see some of my photojournalism in this job in particular. And particularly, um, I wanted to, I wanted the work to be gritty. I wanted it to be gritty, ma like masculine. I wanted it to be raw. I wanted it to be emotional. When I think of 1990s hip hop, this is, I'm thinking gritty and raw, but I do have that unique perspective of being a woman. They hired a woman to go in and shoot really rough and tough men. And so I do think that there is a sort of poeticness to the work. I wanted it to be gritty and masculine, but also have, you know, like a feminine touch. And I do think that I accomplished that with the work. And a couple of BTS images, and we're talking about being women in film and TV. Out of all the jobs- No, she's downstairs. I'm watching a presentation with Lara Gorham. Sorry. Oh, Lara. We'll, we'll, we'll get that muted. I like yeah. to example that. Um, 
on your own. Or do you want to buy? All right, we got it. <laughs> there we go. So when I go into these film sets, it's mostly dominated by white males. You see, you mostly see women in the art department. You see women in hair and makeup, and you see women in costumes. Electric camera and the grip department are predominantly men, and it's predominantly white males. Sometimes you'll see um, men of color in grip, and sometimes you'll see men of color in camera. And now there are also more women in camera too. I don't. I don't want to forget that, but to be a woman of color in camera is something that is very rare. Um, I wanted to include a shot of my second AC friend, Jordan, here. Um, she and I were the only two women of color in the camera department. And speaking to that, I have an operator friend. Her name is Chris Reggie and she started an organization called 600 Black Women, and it highlights all of the Black women and Black women in the camera department across the country. And I believe our union has about maybe 10,000 members, might be a little bit more, a little bit less. But out of that number, only 94 are Black women. And I think it's such important work that she is doing to kind of highlight and create visibility for us. And I'm also really proud to be a part. And speaking of diversity and, and inclusion, this is a still from one of my favorite jobs that I worked on, which is called Partner Track. Partner Track was originally a book written by Helen Wan. And in Netflix's adaption, the star Ingrid Young, she's a Korean American woman who was trying to make partner at her law firm. The only thing is she's surrounded by white men and she's constantly kind of overlooked and underestimated. It's kind of a story of an underdog, which are my favorite stories. And this is one of my favorite stills from the show. I wanted to isolate her and bring her from the background. Here she is in a meeting full of mostly white men. And I didn't want her to be lost in the image. I wanted the viewers to directly go to her to kind of contrast the story. Um, when I'm reading, when I'm reading these scripts, I try to pick out themes and I try to identify key moments. How can, and I'm thinking, you know, how can I photograph this? How does this make sense in my mind? You know, going back to photojournalism, how can I tell this story in one image? And I, I think I accomplished that with the show. Um, it did debut on Netflix as a number two show globally. And I'm very proud of the work. I'm very proud of the release. Um, and with my personal work, I want that work to kind of inspire and create change. And I also want to do that with my unit stills career. Um, because most unit photographers are older, they're white and they're male, and I'm none of that. I feel like in my, in my class of still shooters, we are the generation where you are seeing more diversity, you are seeing more inclusion, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. And that's my presentation. Amazing, Vanessa. And for the students who have logged in to uh, witness this, you guys are witnessing gold right now. Hope you guys are all taking this in. Um, I want to open this up to questions from the panel, Laura and Beth. Do you have any questions for Vanessa? Uh, I have a comment. Well, I do have a question. First, I wanted to find out, like, with your really quick success, I just wanted to point out that doesn't always happen so fast with people who are new to the union. Sometimes it takes like five years or more to get anything, you know, going. So congratulations. I love to see that. And your work is so great. Um, but how does your mom feel about your career choice now? <laughs> um, oh, I don't want to cry on camera. <laughs> um, well, that, that means you're going to speak from the heart. <laughs> She passed before. Oh. She passed right before Wu Tang. So 
she was not able to see the success. Um, I do remember I got, I did a, like a BTS job in Florida. <clears throat> Production company flew me out and the client was, um, starts with the A, they do makeup. Oh uh, man, I forgot the name of it. But anyway, I was, I got flown out and I remember her saying, it's starting. And I was like, oh, okay, mom, we're just, we're just talking. <laughs> You're just being a mom, but she was so right. My career is kind of fast paced and I'm, I'm very grateful. I feel like I have put in a lot of work behind the scenes and now things are starting to happen in my thirties. So for all the students who are watching, keep, please keep shooting, keep going. Um, things happen, but they might not happen as soon as you would hope or expect. Right. I'm sorry about your mom. Yeah. yeah. Laura, do you have any questions or anything to add? Um, I also just have a comment of just congratulations on your work and where you've gotten. You should be really proud. Um, so I first knew, learned of your name, mostly from the production stills uh, that were published from Partner Track, because I watched that show and it was it's, just, it's a fun show, great yeah. show. Um, so then I said, oh, who did this, the photos? Who did the unit on this? And then I saw your name. So that's how I first learned of, of you. So, and then I found you on Instagram. And yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy to see, to have you here and to see, and I look forward to, to following you and your career. Yes, thank you so much. And um, I think I wanna, I wanna open this up to the questions in the chat. It's, it's, we got some things blowing up in there. So if you could stop uh, sharing your screen there, Vanessa, that would be great. And I also wanna thank you. My comment is for, for sharing your experiences, talking about diversity and the need for it continuously. I think we gotta fight for it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not gonna be given to us. Nothing's ever been given to us. And so continue the fight and continue the struggle. And um, I'm very proud of, of you, what you've accomplished in a relatively short amount of time considering how competitive this industry is. Mm -hmm. So going into the chat, uh, we have a comment from uh, Terrence Rory. I'm a graphic designer at the Hallmark Channel, and I don't think of a, a week that goes by where I don't use units photography in my work. You guys are the unsung heroes for graphic designers in the entertainment industry. Um, amazing. Uh, this one, Maria uh, Grinda, she's coming from Mexico City, uh, which is amazing. Uh, international uh, Zoom, Zoom uh, event here. For the three panelists, why did you all choose to be unit still photographers instead of a cinematographer? Uh, mm -hmm. What did you love most about it and what do you like the least about it? And I guess the cha uh, cha challenges and changes with, with social media for you today. It's a lot of questions there. So like whatever you can, each of you, uh, why did you choose this to say, why did you choose still not cinematography? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Vanessa, you want to take that? Oh, yeah. So for me, I chose to do stills um, because I'm more familiar with telling a story in a single image versus a cinematographer who is telling an image in multiple images. I feel like it is, it's similar, but it is very different mindset. And for that's sure. why I chose it. Yeah. Beth? Beth? Oh, I just got um, really excited about photography in middle school. So I was, that was just my, my path. And then I became inspired by the Magnum photographers um, who worked on, you've probably seen all those images from Marilyn Monroe sets. Yeah, that's what I fell in love with. And Laura? Um, yes, yeah, so I did dabble in cinematography during college. Um, I learned that position and then I even dabbled in it during my, pursuit of shooting stills. I just kind of fell into meeting people who needed camera work done, but just wasn't for me. It's it's a whole different beast, you know, different parameters to work with. Um, I had also always loved photography. I like the singleness of it. You know, it's like, it's all on you. Um, you don't have to rely too much on other people and assistance and, um, and yeah, so that's, yeah, that's why. I have to say, you guys are all storytellers and the big difference is one frame a story versus 24 frames in a second, right? How do you get everything in just that one shot? That's an art, it's a skill. Congratulations, you guys are, are, are slaying it. So you wanna ask this question? Sure. Debbie. So Debbie Arlick asks, um, 
are there are there any still unit photographers who work inspires you or your classic photograph from an iconic film that stays with you as you're on set or in your work? Yeah, okay. well, I'll take this. Um, I really love, I might be pronouncing his, his name wrong, but is Jazzin Boltman, is that how you say it? Um, he is a, I wanna say he's from Australia and he did all of the stills for, the Matrix films through uh -huh. one and three, and his work is one of the first first portfolios that I came across, and I was just blown away. I mean, he's shooting Matrix, the Matrix, with film in a book. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, you have to be so skilled yeah. to do all of that. Um, I love Bob Willoughby. Look him up; he's awesome. Great. You. Laura, do you have somebody? Um, no one in particular in mind, but I, I've definitely looked at a lot of people's work um, and um, and growing up, you know, I, I read teen magazines and they do these reviews on movies and things. And I would notice the, the, the stills that they would use in the articles. And I remember it was uh, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. And there's a picture of Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio. And I was trying to find that exact frame. I, again, I thought it was a, a screen grab. So I was trying to find that. I would watch that movie over and over to try to find that same exact still. And, and then, you know, years later when I realized still photography is a thing, that's when I realized, oh, it was a still photographer that took that shot. So, um, yeah. So uh, I, everyone has been an influence. <laughs> uh, this question, hey, it's Beth's kids. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> This question, like from Douglas Hill. <laughs> Hello. this question from Douglas Hill, there's an assumption that what a unit still photographer does is emulate what the film video camera is doing, yet each of you have your own style. Is that something you're aware of and work to convey, or does your personal style simply come through naturally? For me, definitely both. There's uh, there's an intention, and then there's just um, letting things unfold as they unfold. Um, so actually, that image that I had of Never Have I Ever, the two talent looking at each other, um, they never actually shot a two shot like that. But I knew, and, and as a, we were filming that scene, it was mostly being shot as over the shoulders. And um, But I knew that I needed to capture a two shot just like that because uh, I knew that was the only way to really capture that scene. And so I took it upon myself to just grab a two shot while they were shooting and over the shoulder. And I just got lucky that there's no equipment in the way and it was a nice clean shot. So um, yeah, there's definitely uh, intention and decisions and choices. And then other, other times there's also just happy accidents and happy, happy things that just happen. Vanessa, Vanessa yeah. yeah. Do you want to try? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, with that, I I like to blend my personal style <clears throat> with, so what happens is a lot of times the networks, they send us um, shot lists. They have priorities. We have priority images that we are required to capture. So I try to take my personal style and blend it to whatever the studio needs. Um, it depends on where the camera, where the motion picture cameras are. It depends on how tight the space is it kind of depends on placement where you can be so that's how i like to work work it yeah um, i i just can't help but inject humor in my work and if any of you know me um so i started this series called the photo of the week and i started it because i was not doing anything and i wanted to be a photographer so it, it's turned into la street photography it went in for 10 years and even when I started to get work, I was still shooting it. I'm still working on a book right now for it. But it's like the juxtapositioning, the color, the liveliness of Los Angeles street photography. Like it always inform my set photography because I cannot help to juxtaposition something weird okay. on set. So I, you know, it probably won't get used, but I just, I don't know. I just have fun with it. I like the comedy of life and the comedy of being on set because it's like, it's the real being unreal, being real. Mm -hmm. And I just think about that a lot. And I'm just like, what am I, what life am I living here? Like I'm on set, it's like fake, but like 
these things have happened. It's like, yeah, it just kind of blows me away. A lot of the days I'm in awe. <laughs> Great. Thanks for sharing. Thanks. I think we have a couple time for a couple more. Yeah, we have McKenna Davis. So McKenna is about to graduate. And so she's at that aha moment almost. It's coming up. What do you what what is a tip that you could all offer somebody starting out in the business right now, not exactly knowing? Um, I know McKenna, her work's amazing, um, but she doesn't know exactly where she's gonna fit. How does somebody starting out passionate about the business, what do you do? Take it away. Anybody yeah. want to take it away? I would try all the genres and do it on a Sunday or whatever. Do product photography. Just make it up. Send it out to your friends and family. Do fashion. Do whatever on, on your time off. And just whatever fills you with passion, I would say go toward that. Yeah, I would kind of say create your own projects. Um, if you let's say you wanted to do photojournalism, but you don't have any context, I would say go out into the world and kind of create your own stories. That way you create one or two stories and you have a book and you can show that book to whoever is in charge of hiring. So I would kind of take what Beth said and do that, create your own work, and then you have portfolios. I agree. I piggyback on everyone else. Um, just shoot anything and everything, experiment a lot, um, and then find what interests you the most. Um, get friends together, um, go out, every every single genre, documentary, street, portraits, studio. I'm a self-taught digital photographer. I self-taught myself studio lighting. So um, yeah, there's a lot, and there's so many online. Um, you went to school for this, but, um, but yeah, every, do as much as you can. And as long as you're passionate about it, you'll you'll find a place that you'll end up falling into. Yeah, and if I wanna to add to that, Vanessa mentioned that she did everything from assisting digital teching, wedding photography product for my students who are, are logged in today. Yeah, say yes to everything. I say it's in class. Someone's asked you, can you take headshots for this office? Say yes, and you better say yes, because we, we did this in class, right? So um, you, you know how to do this. You're trained to do this. Go out, go out and do it. If you don't like it, you found out you didn't like it. Move on to the next thing. Just keep going shooting. You'll eventually find something, something will stick. Um, let's, let's keep going here. I think we have a time for maybe, maybe one more. Um, uh, Dominique Fuelas, each panelist has have amazing pictures for their presentation. This just, just kudos. Wu-Tang is legendary from Terrence Rory. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jessica, uh, uh, hey, you three for doing unit stills. Do you also need to be knowledgeable in key art shoots? Do you need to know studio lighting to get certain jobs? Very good question. Laura, I wanna, I wanna throw that to you. You hired me on one of your key art shoots. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> it, it does help to be knowledgeable in, in studio lighting for key art shoots. Um, and if you're not, you just won't get hired for it. So, <laughs> so I say, yes, get knowledgeable about it because those are some pretty big jobs. They can pay pretty well. And um, and yes, studio lighting is a very nice asset to have in your portfolio. So, um, and that's also super easy to create and do on your own, create a, a, a sample portfolio. So yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, yeah, learn, learn your strobes, learn, um, learn your strobes, learn your studio lighting, um, uh, three-point lighting setup your what is it key your film all of it is very knowledgeable and it can add it can add a lot of income to one job mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Um, yeah totally agree both of you and I want like to add to that is to learn the language learn about usage learn about what commercial photographers earn for marketing campaigns. This is extremely important because we don't want to undercut our commercial colleagues, you know, um, or other people. It just brings us all down. So um, that's going to help. And unless you have an agent, then don't worry about it. Most of us don't have an agent. So like get that education, read everything you can on it. Oh, speaking, speaking to that, Beth, um, what do you recommend as resources to kind of because I actually want to beef up my knowledge with that do you have any books that you would recommend or websites 
or resources? I'd have to think I, on that actually. Who has? Who has when I learned studio lighting and just additional photography skills, uh, I, I I learned it through Creative Live. No, no, I, I mean, know like, oh. I'm talking about like licensing and usage. Yeah. Oh. Um, through other photographers. Right? Right <laughs> yeah. There, right? <laughs> we could have a whole other panel. It's a, yeah. that. <laughs> like a weekend, but I don't have anything go to right now, but there are some organizations that you could become members of who do talk about things like this. Like ASMP. there's APA. Yeah. APA, ASMP, uh, those organizations, they have uh, panels like this that just talk about strictly like licensing. The whole thing is dedicated to that. So mm -hmm. for anyone out there who's interested in doing that, yeah, ASMP, a APA, uh, look them up. Uh, they have these programs that, that can help uh, hopefully answer these, these questions, you guys. Okay. Uh, before we wrap it up, I want to open this up to the panelists. Do you guys have any final comments, thoughts uh, uh, amongst yourselves or for, for the audience? I just really appreciate you guys doing this and creating this topic and giving us the platform to share our experiences um, and opening it up to not um, photographers who aren't who aren't aware of what unit photography is, because um, this is a really great photography community that this organization has built. So um, yeah, I just thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we're, we're thrilled to learn more about what you've done and what you're doing. So, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't. I come from the East Coast, not the film community, not any of this. So this is new in my world. So, but what you do is amazing. And seeing all your work and how different it all is, also truly inspiring. So super happy that you were all here tonight. Final comments, Vanessa, Beth. I'm just thankful to be here. Thank you for including me with these two other phenomenal shooters. I came across Beth's work many years ago before I even met her. So it was really cool to be on a panel with her and speaking to the students. It's really cool. <laughs> Fun. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, especially with Vanessa and Laura, and to have you guys moderate. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment to the thing, the question in the chat about um, there was a. Sometimes when you're first getting started, there's very low budget features who they're like, "Oh, we'll just take screen grabs. We don't need a still photographer." But one thing you can say to them is it's not only about a screen grab, and screen grabs are hard to get. People sit there. You have to have like a still enough frame to grab it and then someone's sitting there for hours trying to look like people don't really I'll, always don't know what a screen grab involves in getting but we also do so much more than that we do the product placement and we also tell the story mm -hmm. of the production mm -hmm. in our behind the scenes photos so if you want to convince someone who's producing to have something in their budget for it is like well I'm going to tell the story of how you made this project it's great that's, you can't get that in the screen can't get grab. that that's a great answer. Oh, thank you for that. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, the audience, for attending uh, this evening. It was very informative. And also, go to our website. We still have that award that's up. Uh, please submit your work and get a chance to win $2,000 in, in grant money. Anything else to say, Alan? No, really happy everybody was here tonight. Join us May and May for Open Show with Lori and Erica. That will be a great open show. Now. Thank you, Vanessa and Laura and Beth. Welcome to our extended community. You're always going to live on YouTube. And thank you all for coming. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.